I want to uh, do something really quick because we're going to be attacking senior people in the homily, or, or maybe raising them up. And since Father Hillary is 87 today, I thought we would raise him up. At the Council of... Na Are you waiting on something, Hillary? <laughs> well, we'll sing happy birthday at the end. Okay, okay. <laughs> at the Council of Nicaea, the Catholic bishops of the world, but there weren't any other bishops just saying, okay? Um, the, the church, the Christian church, uh, came together with his leadership and its bishops, and it decided that the canon, meaning all the books of the Bible, that they knew of, was now closed. So that's in the middle of the third century. They decided that they had everything that they needed, they could close it. Well, what right had they to decide? Well, they did their best with what who they were as the shepherds of the church in the known world, in the Greek world, in the world that they lived in, and they decided they had everything. But this particular story was probably not in the book in, in John. And in fact, a lot of the Greek, Greek manuscripts that we have today that exist from that period don't have it. And why do you think that is? Because the early church thought, Jesus is really easy on sin, and Jesus is really easy on this woman, and we really don't like this. So it wasn't written in a lot of the texts of the day. There's no guarantee that it was or it wasn't in, in that moment in the church at the Council of Nicaea. I tell you that because I believe, and the church believes, that the Spirit of God did not stop talking to us or working with us or being present to us in all of the ways that the Spirit was present to Jesus. Just because of the resurrection and the ascension into heaven, the Spirit of God is very much alive and continues to talk to us. Amen? Amen. And so it is in a prayerful response to the church at the time of Nicaea that they collected all the documents that they knew about. But the Spirit of God had a way of making sure that this story is in the canon and in the place that it's in. Because we need to hear it. We need to hear the story of compassion, of mercy, and of love. Because a lot of times we are not compassionate, we are not merciful, and we are not loving. Amen? amen? Oh, I got a big amen for all the sinners in church. And so it is in this holy act of remembering, if, if we take what happens up here as some dull document that was written 2,000 years ago, then we have missed the point. The Word of God is alive and active and present just in the same way the Word of God is alive and present in the church and it's received teaching all the way up. Now, is the church always in need of reform? Does the church make mistakes? Yes! It is human and divine. So we do make mistakes. We know the mistakes, but we also listen to the voice of God. And so this particular document is planted right there for a very good reason. In the midst of all of this, there is the holy remembering. When we, like the Jewish people, remember the, 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 the Passover, they don't see it as a holy remembering. In other words, it's making present the reality of freeing from slavery, passing over. Jesus is talking to us here and now through these words. And so in that moment, in the Babylonian exile, God has already been faithful. God has already done. There is a holy remembering of what has been done in a really good way. And God is saying, okay, 
you have been an adulterer, Israel, because you have not followed the law. You have not followed the covenant of your hearts. But I will take you back from Babylon, and I will bring you back to the promised land. Can you not see what I am doing for you right now? This new thing. And we have to hear that with ears that is speaking to us in this place and at this time in this little bit piece of North Oakland. God is saying to us, can you not hear, can you not see what I am doing for you right now? I love you. And Paul hears this in the same way. Paul's remembering, although is difficult at best, because Paul murdered people. Paul killed and went out to seek and kill the body of Christ. We are the sum total of all that we are. Mind, body, soul, sexuality, remembering good and bad. We are all of that that gets us to this moment with the potential for God to do good things, to help us see Him doing something right now in this place at this time. Can you see what I'm doing? And Paul saw it. Now, we don't all get knocked off our horses, although Paul was never on a horse. <laughs> but we don't get knocked over and have that level of connection to Christ. But it is open to us through our baptism and the sacraments and the church and the community gathered together. So Paul recognizes that he is all of that, but his sole goal and his remembering is, um, well, we all hold on to things sometimes in our life and are remembering about other people. You know, there's two people in the story we're about to hear. There's those people in life who see that they're not sinners, they have a great relationship with God, they follow the rules, and they're very quick to point out someone else's sin. Don't all say amen because we're all guilty of it. We are all of these people. I remember a moment in my own life where when my father took his own life, he became the father that committed suicide. And no matter how much I try to let that go, I filter my father's life through that moment. And I pray to let go of it, but I can't. So I, I just have to be okay that one day, the other side of heaven, it may work out. But we see people through their sins, and we keep them in boxes, and we keep them over there. So there's the ones, like the Pharisees, who only see the other sin and never look at their own sin. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so in this moment, you have these people who take this woman. Should this, should this story be called the adulterous woman or the woman caught in adultery? Should it not be, where is the man who was caught in adultery? <laughs> Hello, it takes two to tango. And they're out to catch Jesus. They're not even following the law of Moses. They're not even following the law they say they're following because you have to have one or two witnesses and you have to bring both people. They're out to trick Jesus and if he says one way, he's for the Romans. If he says the other way, he's breaking their law. So here he is. What's he doing when he's riding on the ground? I think he was doodling. <laughs> you know what? You're at a boring meeting sometimes and you just doodle. I think he could have been doodling. Playing a little bit of time to work out what's going on. Don't think that Jesus automatically knew how to handle those guys. I think it was an ongoing learning experience. Or maybe <clears throat> he was writing down all of their sins. He could have been doing a whole lot of things. It's not really that important. The important thing is 
He lifts up the moment, gives them enough mercy and compassion for them to examine their own lives, offer them who were ready to cast the first stone and say, let the person without sin cast the first one. And the people who were as old as Father Hillary, the elders, left first. <laughs> it was the seniors who left first, because the longer you live, the more you realize how life is. Yes? You know, it's kind of that whole scene where uh, youth, what is, how does that go? Uh, you, uh, youth is lost on the young. How does that go? Wasted on the young. That's right. Youth is wasted on the young. Because if we had the wisdom of the years that we knew, we would do things a whole lot differently. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> and so it is out of that experience that Jesus expresses that mercy, allows them to go off, and allows them to contemplate their own, uh, their own experience of life. And all of a sudden, she is left alone. She only has one line in there. Where are they? Has anyone condemned you? And so it's out of that experience of love that God, they're looking at her and they have eyes of judgment. Jesus is not saying that adultery is okay. Adultery is not okay. It is a breaking of a covenant of love. And uh, there's always broken relationships in our world. We know that. And I think God is always there lifting and loving us and bringing us to the best version of ourselves. But the ideal, the goal, is an important thing to hold. And he's not saying that that's okay. What he is saying is that he looks on her with eyes of love and compassion and mercy and caring. And it is, it, that is the same way that he looks at each and every one of us. He's looking at us with eyes of love, with compassion and mercy. And so we are all of these people in this story. We need to hear this story in order to be able to look into our own hearts and all those different moments in our lives when we are Pharisees, we, when we are the adulterous woman, when we are all of these things, and yet God is going to continually, freely look for us. God is continuing saying to us, listen to my word. Listen to my word. Be fed at my table of the very essence of me and then go out into the world and send some more. That's what we say at the end of Mass. Go out into the world and be my presence, be my mercy, be my compassion, and see the world as I see it. And that's a tall order for all of us, because it's very easy to come in here and celebrate lovely music, listen to the Word, and isn't that lovely, and we've done what we needed to do, and then we go out into the world, and we may be a little different than what we want to be. Amen? Amen. But we know with one another that through the sacraments of the church, the sense of community, and the gift of repentance and mercy, we are loved. And that is the thing that each and every one of us, I often, I cannot tell you how many times in confession, Although, there's no sinners at St. Columba because nobody comes to confession at St. Columba. I'm just saying. But in other churches, where there are sinners, I cannot tell you how often people come and tell you as a priest something they did 30 years ago. And they cannot forgive themselves. I always deal with that immediately. Or someone who's coming in with the same old thing they've said since they were seven years old. It almost sounds like I hit my brother, I disrespected my mom, and, and you're 70 years old and you're saying that? <laughs> you know, we're called to grow up. We're called, uh, if there's something going on in your life that kicks you away from being the best version of yourself, and you do it and it's a negative thing, and it takes you away seven times a week, you know what I tell people? Do it six times a week. You know, don't go back and not have a plan on how to fix it. And then somebody said to me, Father, are you telling me to sin six times? 
No, what I'm telling you is the negative thing you're doing to hurt yourself, do it less. And maybe the next six months when you come back, another one less. And maybe you will reach perfection. We're not talking about perfection here. We're talking in the same way as that woman went off, go sin no more. We're invited to do the same. We're invited to be compassionate. We're invited to use the sacrament of reconciliation. We are, through our baptism, invited to, for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you celebrate Mass, we take this chalice for the forgiveness of sins. We celebrate this reality all of the time. So we needed this story. We need to remember in a holy remembering, but we also need to let go of the stick that beats ourselves up that God's already told us to throw it down. Amen. Amen. Will our elect, Sonia, Laurel, please come forward with your godparents. And I ask our candidate.